right, let's get started. I haven't seen y'all since 2023. Uh, yeah. It's been a good... We, I've been, I enjoy the time off, and then I'm also enjoying coming back. It's, it's, I kind of enjoy our, our December break. Um, I need a married male to lead us in prayer. I just wish... Jo- oh, Josh is a married male. <laughs> Josh, that works out just right. Adam, it was going to be a, a lob to you. It was coming, R. Lee Young, it was coming to the back, but then there's Josh, newly married male. Lead us, would you? Amen. So guys, um, for those of you that know and for those of you that don't, we are doing what I call Christian worldview rather than biblical. I just really want to emphasize Christ as much as possible. Christian worldview, which is to say we are Christians, what do we believe and how do we live? And we are not quite halfway through it. This is session 10. It is designed to be 23. Three weeks, I believe. There's a, there'll be a few more things we do. So we're not quite halfway there. And this is just a super broad, let's catch up super quick. We talk about three trees in here a lot. Three major worldviews in the world. We say the first one is what? Naturalism. Define, somebody define naturalism for me. Yep. Exactly right, Caleb. Only the natural world exists, right? Only what humans can verifiably, scientifically prove, that which is provable, which is pretty limiting if you think about it. There's a lot of life which is not scientifically... You know history is not scientifically provable? Did you know that? Did you know the thoughts you're having in your brain right now are not scientifically provable? Did you know that scientists will admit freely that the most subjective thing in the universe is the human experience? Raise your hand if you knew that. They will, they will freely admit that the human experience is, they, many of them would say, completely subjective. So how much can science actually do? So the naturalist, I find this really interesting, but in 2023-24, the naturalist has more problems than people of faith do. Because there's too much that they can't answer for with their limited scope. You with me? Okay. What's the second worldview tree? Tree. No. Do the, uh, not, don't do Christianity. Do the other one. Transcendent. Transcendentalism. Someone define transcendentalism for me. Broadly. What are the major religions under transcendentalism? Hinduism. Buddhism. A lot of the Eastern faiths. Shintoism. Taoism. We would, what, where, would we say the New Age movement? Spirituality and transcendentalism. In transcendentalism, you get all the spirituality, but what don't you get? You don't get a relationship. Why, Wilson? There's no creator God, is there? There's no person called God in transcendentalism. It's just good and evil, upright and down, right? There's, there's moral codes, to be sure. There's a set of religious stru- structures and ideas, but there's no, there's no tangible God figure that you can be in relationship with. Also, we said this, naturalism and transcendentalism both end up being what? Do you recall where, where, the, where you land with both of these? Yeah, a big nothing, Caleb says. Whether you're a naturalist and you believe that life ends at life and there is no afterlife, or whether you're a transcendentalist, what's the goal? To cease to exist. So why spend 10,000 years reincarnating to get there when you can just hold that you have the one human life and then you go back to being worm food? So whether you're a transcendentalist or whether you're a naturalist, you both are saying, whatever this thing is, this is it. And then after it, there's nothing. Because even nirvana, definitionally, means what? To cease. Concept of nirvana, which is a transcendental heaven, is to become one with the nothing. 
We've said it before, a drop in the ocean, where'd the drop go? Right? I mean, and these aren't, these aren't my conceptions of these faiths. This is how they speak about I got on a Buddhist website, this was about a month and a half ago, because sometimes I feel guilty describing transcendental faiths the way that I do. And I got on this Buddhist website, and I spent about two hours on it, and fortunately it was in English. And this guy was really competent, really, you know, this was, this was a real, this wasn't just a blog, this was like a denominationally led, kind of a big name, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just scrolling through it and reading through it, and I'm like, wow, these are things I say, these are things I say. These are not things that I'm putting upon Buddhists in some incredibly derogatory fact. They just, this is what they hold. Okay? So, naturalism, nothing matters, you live, you die. Hope you had fun. Transcendentalism. And then one other thing we said is naturalism believes in only the natural world is real. Transcendentalists say, what, what is real? The only the spiritual. Right? So a transcendentalist, you push them far enough and they'll say, this isn't even real. This is, to, to, to Sid Arthur Gautama, the Buddha, he would say, this is an illusion. Right? There's entire branches of these denominations and faiths that will say everything is illusory. Right? Suffering's not real. Pain's not real. The human experience isn't real. This is all either a dream, it's a mirage, it's a facsimile, it's a copy. And what you got to do is push through it. Right? It's not really real. So to the naturalist, the spiritual world doesn't exist. To the transcendentalist, the physical world doesn't exist. What does the Christian say? You're here. And if I pinch you, it hurts. And as Shakespeare said, if I cut you, you will bleed. So, uh, okay, so that's just a bit of a, a, a catch up. Christian worldview is what we're doing. We're looking at the three big trees and we're on ethics. We're talking about the fruits of worldviews and we're on ethics. We, session nine, which was three months ago, and now session 10, which is finishing up ethics. And we, we titled this one, Why Do You Call Me Good? Let's ask a couple questions and then I have a challenge and we're going to look at Mark 10. Here's a question. If you saw a $10 bill on the ground right outside of a store, what would you do? I am, that's a real question. Now, I'm going to, listen to me carefully. I'm going to playfully judge you today. So if you feel judged today, I did my job. Right? There will be some judgment. This is not a judgment-free zone, but it is a judgment-playful zone. Do you hear me? Playful judgment. Playful judgment. That sounds like a band name, doesn't it? If you saw a $10 bill outside of a store, on the street, what would you do? Now don't give me the Sunday school answer just because you want to. I know the Sunday school answer. What would you actually do? I see some of you smirking, which is already telling me your answer, and that's okay. Sister Meow. The reason I'm here. I wasn't looking at you for the smirk. I is because uh, people my age grow, growing up in China know what to do. Tell me. Uh, we have a song for it, and we give it to a policeman. Oh. <laughs> we have a song. Oh. How we were raised. Sing it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I think when we grow up with five cents, yeah, talking about five cents because yeah, it's a lot of money. So raise your hand if your situation or, or background is like Sister Meow's. Yeah, quite a few of you. I get that. When when I was growing, raise your. Do we have any Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts in here? Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts? Brother Jeffrey, do you, 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 Adam, do y'all do you remember, you may not, do y'all remember the magazines where you'd look in the back and it'd be like Goofus and Gallant? Do you remember those? So, go, yeah, Gallant, so Gallant, Gallant is an old English word which means you kind of have honor. And Goofus is a real common word. I think you understand what a goofus is, right? A goofus is a goofus. Uh, and so you would see these kinds of morality situation. Sister, this is our example. You would see these moralities and then Gallant would do it the right way and Goofus would do it the wrong way. And so for Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, we, do you remember those, Adam? I remember the magazines as well. Yeah. I've seen some comics in the back. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was a that was a big one, and it was just always the the morality choice of what do you do. Um, is there anybody honest enough in here to say they'd put it in their pocket? Yeah, all right. Uh, I, mean, I appreciate that honesty. Go ahead, go ahead, uh, Josh. I was just dealt with the reasons because anybody you ask is going to say, "Yeah, that's mine." Yeah. There's no way to have any evidence. Unless you saw it fall out of somebody's pocket, clearly are good about it. Yeah. So I said playful judgment. I'm going to actually not judge you on this one. I, I I know that there are many people who would have different answers on this. I saw you smirking. But it, but here's but here's here's the here's the real question. Can we get to a Christian response on this? What do you think the best Christian response is likely to be? Can we can we get to that? I think we can. Yeah, let's look at the question. If you saw a $10 bill on the ground right outside a store, what's the most Christ-like response to this question? I think. I don't think this is complicated. The store owner, right? Put, take it to the desk. It does did we have to? We didn't have to struggle. Now I understand, and I was. I'm picking on you. Some of us are putting it in our pockets, and some of us are singing, you know, the jingles of our youth. But is the Christ-like response not to process that it's not mine? Can we agree it's not our money? So if it's not our money, whose is it? Not mine. That's the first answer. It's not mine, right? And so then the Christian response might be, I'm not beholden to the world to get this $10 back to its owner, right? We can agree on that. I'm not making it my life's mission. I've come across money, so have you. Um, there's been times, if it, like if it was in the middle of the woods or somewhere nondescript, yeah, I'd probably put it in my pocket. I've actually done all three of these. I've left it where it was, I've put it in my pocket, and I've taken it back where I thought it should go. And I think depending on the circumstances, you might do one of all three of those things. Um, so I'm not making some broad sweeping thing. But how you answer, here's the whole point. How you answer that question is almost more important than the question itself. How you, why, why you did what you did and how you did what you did is really more important in some ways. Because that's the idea of ethics. Brother Jeff, you look like you want to, no. Um, you know, God's going to hold us accountable for why we did stuff. Do you know that? Do y'all think much about that? Like, you don't always just think if I do right, I'm good, and if I do bad, I'm bad, do you? You don't just always think that, do you? Some of you are obeying your parents and being very disrespectful while you do it. Yes? And I was once a child, and I did the same thing. Ethics is concerned with why you do what you do as much as what you do. And so you may be dutiful and disobedient. Now what Bible passage do we have that represents that? What's a New Testament parable in which you can see what I'm saying? The person was dutiful. In other words, they did their duty. They were obedient. And they were very far from the love of God. Do you recall? Prodigal sons, the story. Who? Which character? The older brother. The older brother, right? What's the older brother do the moment the father shows grace to the younger brother? Hey, hey, hey. Time out. He's angry. He's angry. Where's my reward? Why was he obeying? Why was he obeying his father? He expected a reward. He thought it was his duty. Was this an expectation? Was he doing it with love? How do we know that he wasn't doing it out of love? He was not happy when the brother came back. Super unhappy. Yeah. Something's wrong with that older brother. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Why you do what you do is as important as what you do. Yes? That's a biblical response. Okay, so I'm not going to give you a hard time about the $10 bill. Question number two. What are most people's motivations for why they do the things they do? 
What are most people's, there's a real answer to this. What are most people's motivations for why they do what they do? What's the Sunday school, let's give the Sunday school answer. Because it's the right thing to do. What else? Jesus, Jesus yeah, my, my religion, right? So it's the right thing to do, my religion tells me so, you know, the songs of my youth. What's the real answer? <clears throat> What are most people's motivations for why they do the things that they do? Is it because of the nature of human? Human nature? What were you going to say, Wilson? They benefit from it. it they benefit from it? I like, I, like those, I like both of those answers. I, I'm going to give a little bit of a different one, but I like both of those answers. Someone else? You just look ready to talk, brother. You just, you're just leaning in. I'm ready to call on you. I would think that the naturalist would do whatever made him feel good. Yeah. Because this is all there is. Yep. And the transcendentalist might do the same, but also might be thinking whatever might bring him the best karma. For yep. The karma equals reward. So s sort of similar. So you want to hear the real... Yeah, so I love all of that. And I think all of that is right. I think everything, everybody that said something there, I think is right. I want you to think a little differently here. So this is not a I'm right, you're wrong. This is a let's add this to the, to the conversation. Why do most people do what they... Why do most people... What are most people's motivations for why they do the things that they do? People do what they want. People do what they want. People do what they want. Now that's all caught up in the things you said, Jeffrey. It's all caught up in the things you said, Stacy. It's all caught up in the things that y'all said. That's why I said those are all good answers. At the end of the day, I want you to process this with me. Do you not feel like you mostly do the things you want? And I'm not talking about young people who still have to live at home, still have to live with your parents. Here's an example. Your parents may say to you, X, Y, Z, you still have to do you know, these 15 things while you're under my house, right? But the moment you close your door, you're in your own bedroom. Your mom and your daddy are not standing over you 24-7. Agreed? What's the first thing you do when you shut your door? That's something that you want to do. Are you with me? So yeah, you might have three hours of homework to do. And it's, let's say it's uh, 7 o'clock at night. You may have three hours of homework to do. I remember being a kid. That doesn't mean as soon as you shut that door, you immediately go to your homework. Young people are funny. I know my, I know my Chinese brothers and sisters study more than I did. There's no question about that. There's no question about that. I know that you study more than I did. I, I concede that. I know that you work harder than I did. I concede that. Do you hear me? Pound for pound, not all of you, pound for pound, most of you are doing more homework and, and working harder than I did. But you're not working as hard as you think you are because you're still listening to the radio, watching TV on YouTube, doing the things you want to do, going where you want to do. You're still doing all that too, right? And so all I'm saying is, what are you doing when you have freedom? What are you doing when you have freedom? And this is for the adults too. What are you doing when you have freedom? A lot of us are doing what we want to do. We buy the things we want to buy. We say the things we want to say. We think the thoughts we want to think. We go where we want to go. We talk to who we want to talk to. There's a lot of self-behavior. And this is back to some of the comments. There's a lot of self-behavior what we might say is selfish behavior in every human heart. Y'all agree with that? Y'all agree with that? Let's get the back row in on this. Leung, you agree with that? Yeah. Selfish hearts? Me, me, me and you? Us too? Uh, right? Now, can Christ overcome selfish hearts? What has to happen to that selfish heart? Die. I love that. That's great. I love it. I love it. John 14? Die. That's a, that's, a, that's, I mean, that's the winning answer. Change. Grow. Give. Give up, brother. 
Jesus You'll obey me. Yeah, John fifteen fourteen. John fourteen fifteen. Here's a challenge. Y'all ready? Young people, listen to me very carefully. Now, this is for everybody. This is the challenge for everybody. Young people, I've already talked to your parents. Young people, look at me. I've already talked to your parents. This Sunday school class is going to do a 72-hour media fast. For 72 hours, you're not going to do... For 72 hours, everybody but Lee Young is going to do... <laughs> For 72 hours, we are, we are not going to use any technology that we don't have to for school or work. So for 72 hours, you are not going to be on YouTube, you are not going to be on your phones, radio, you're not going to do any of those things for 72 hours starting tonight, which means you would not do any of the media technology that you would, what, want to do until Thursday morning. Sunday night to Monday night, Monday night to Tuesday night, Tuesday night to Wednesday night, and then you should go to sleep. Your parents have agreed. I'm asking every adult to be a part of this. Do the, do the adults agree? Do the adults agree in the room? The new married guy says, all right, Adam, thank you, brother. Adam back there is a teacher. Kids, I've gotten your parents' approval. 72 hours. Wilson, how do you feel about that? Uh, the no, nope, very little classification. <laughs> how do you fit? I didn't ask you. I didn't ask you to navigate the rules. By the way, what you just did was a type of ethical response. What I asked you was, how do you feel about it? You can be honest. Your mom's not gonna fuss at you. Yeah. <laughs> Jabez, how do you feel? Uh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Jabez, you, you can't just lie in Sunday school. <laughs> this is still Sunday school. <laughs> Stacy. I got a question. What about the young adults? Well, I'm asking everybody. I'm asking everybody to do it. What I was telling the teenagers was I got parent approval to kind of put pressure on them. Okay, does this count like... Everybody. We're asking everybody to do it. So if I'm reading the Bible, no, that's not no, that's not media technology. No, I'm saying like, okay, if I read the Bible while I'm listening to the fireplace, does that count as using media? Mm -mm. No, Bible's not okay. So somebody give me an honest, somebody give me an honest feedback on how you feel about doing a 72-hour uh, fast that for some of you you didn't get asked to do. If, Wilson, if I read a book. Stop asking questions about the parameters. Stop asking those questions. The question I asked was, how do you feel? How do you feel? I already know how you feel. <laughs> Sister Lay. If I just myself, is that most unnecessary thing? Not what I want. Right. That's the, the I'm a lot of to do some more Yeah, yeah, live life. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I agree. Yes, yes, Sam. Uh, uh, so, if you're like no like messages, right? No like texting? Yeah, it would just all of that, it just nested, like if the house is on fire, you can text somebody. But otherwise, no <laughs> communication. <laughs> Okay, so now listen, all my little brothers and sisters, especially all my, let's say high school and down. Everybody looking at me? High school and down? We're not actually doing this. We're not actually doing this. Sam, now how do you feel? Yeah. We're not actually doing this. But now listen to me. What I did get approval from, from the, the moms in the room especially, was I used to do this when I taught Bible at CCS. And I want to walk you through this. So stay with me for the next three minutes. We used to really do this. Sam, we really did this assignment. 72-hour media fast. It was, uh, it was graded. 
And the response that y'all just had, now listen, I love you very much and I already told you that I was going to playfully judge you this morning. The experience that you just had is very human. Which is to say, not so very Christ-like. I'm playfully judging, you with me? But it was very human. This was a Christian school that I taught at. These grades were always like 24 students, 24 students. About, I had about 48 students. Let's just say 50 students. Listen to me. Every single year that I did this, they all knew it was coming. They hated it. And the first thing that I got pushed back was all the types of questions that y'all just asked me. You think The reason why I was laughing as y'all were asking me and why I cut y'all off, I've heard them all. I've heard them all. I've heard every question that someone under the ages of 20 could possibly ask me about how to navigate around this media fast. Isn't that funny? But what if, what if, but what if, but how about, but what if, but what if, but how about? They're already freaking out. They haven't even left the classroom. They're still mine for the next... Y'all were freaking out. We still got 20 minutes of Sunday school left. Y'all weren't going to hear anything else I said. If I didn't tell you this was a joke, you wouldn't have listened to anything else I said the rest of the Sunday school hour. Do y'all agree with that? <laughs> this is a hum- this is this little test, this little exercise has value. Can y'all see that? Because to me, it's not a listen to me, young people, listen to me, everybody, sister Lay, I'm with you. Everybody listen to me. Listen. This this media fast is not about fasting from media, although it is. This media fast <laughs> is a beautiful barometer for where you are spiritually. It is a beautiful test for you. I don't really... Listen, you're acting very normal, very human. And so I'm not, I'm not offended or upset or angry. I'm not anything. You hear me? I'm telling you, this is a test for you to think about. Not for me to think about. By the way, guess who did the media fast every year? This guy. Guess who hated it every year? So they only did it once. I did it five times. I should probably keep it going in my life. Right? Because the fact that I just told you I hated it says something about me. So um, I think that's enough trying to process it on my end. You try to process it. How do you feel? Adam, how do you feel now? You gallantly raised your hand, but how do you feel knowing that it's just kind of a barometer? You're a teacher. How do you, what are your thoughts? Uh, So I feel relieved. Uh, Even though I know it's good for me, it may be good for me to be some distraction. Yeah. Uh, But again, I'm relieved. Yeah. Someone else? Josh. In high school, we did something similar. Okay. I don't know if it was 72 hours. Regardless, of like, it like helped me to face a lot of things that I've been trying to get my mind off of. Right. And it was very, yeah, it was, I think that was the biggest struggle. It wasn't like the perceived boredom of it. it more so like my mind actually like being confronted with things I needed to pray about and things I've been trying to avoid for a long yeah. time. Yeah. And I love the word that you used as distraction because clearly technology and media is a massive distraction for our lives. I have to remind my, y- y'all know that y'all know that I love fiction. You know that I love books and movies, and you know that I love the fictional, the, the world of fantasy, the world of imagination. I have to remind myself t- sometimes I'm a 51 year old white guy living in Mississippi who's a son, a father, a husband who has a bad back. Blah blah blah. Do you understand that? Because sometimes I just want to go slay dragons and fight bad guys and, 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 and live in a mountainous region and drink hot tea. Do, do, can you relate? Can, you, can anybody relate to that? So, you know, thank you for <laughs> affirming me in that. <laughs> I really sometimes think it's just me, but uh, 
But yeah, so we, we get detached, don't we? We get detached. Someone else and then we're going to move on. Okay, so never forget that moment. Never forget how you felt when you were told you were going to have to do a 72-hour media fast. Don't forget that. Kind of hold on to that. Uh, I think it's valuable. Okay? Why do, you do, why do humans do what they do? Mostly because they want to. Mostly because they want to. Okay? That's true for... Sam, that's true for all humans, including this guy. You with me? Most humans do what most humans want to do most of the time. That's a harsh reality. Let's turn to Mark 10 really quick. Um, Can I get somebody to read it with passion and vigor? You feel like reading, uh, Ian? Can you read loud for us? Mark 10, verses 17 to 27. You know this story. So listen, pay attention. You know this story. So pay attention because we're only going to pull out a few truths this morning. The Sometimes called the rich young ruler. Sometimes called the young, the young lawyer. It's in, I believe it's in three of the four Gospels. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, t- uh, 17 to 27. Man before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal. Do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And he said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. It's hardened by this saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God? And the disciples were amazed at his word. But Jesus says to them again, Children, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are are possible with God. Okay, so let's just kind of move quick. Again, most of you know this story. Let's just move quickly through it. And remember, we're looking at ethics. We're looking at... You know, what do we call good? What do we call bad? Why do we do it? How do we do it? Who do we do it for? What do we do? And so verse 17, this man, the young man is connecting goodness, which is a moral trait, to eternal life. What is he doing there? What's he doing as it relates to ethics? Jeffrey, you talked about this earlier. Do you know what he, what's he doing? He's looking for... Qualify himself. Work around. around. Reward. He wants a reward, right? So what's his ethic? Why why does he think he's doing what he's doing? For reward. This is a very common... You know how many Christians I know? Listen, one of the great atheist arguments against Christianity, and I loathe it, it's, it's a despicable argument. You should know it. One of the great atheist arguments against religious people, what is it? We only do what we do to go to heaven. We only do what we do to be rewarded. Raise your hand if you knew that. You knew that as an atheist argument. It's a, it's a man, they hate us for that. They have somehow framed us as these toddlers who are only saying, eh. And that's, that's just such a, a, a ridiculous uh, uh, descriptor of what it means to follow Christ. Right? That's just not Christian, that's not Christian worldview. It's not biblical worldview. Christian worldview is you will, su- you, as, bro- as Priscilla's father, my brother said, die. You will die. To follow Christ. You will suffer to follow Christ. You will give up to follow Christ. Are you, are you still thinking about the media fast? I hope you are. We're to die to our own what? 
desires, wants, selves. Okay? This guy's all reward-based. Verse 18, Jesus declares goodness and ethic as what? <clears throat> Verse 18, a trait of God. Where does goodness come from? God, God who alone is good. God, who says this? God. Thank you, Wilson. I, a big misunderstanding of this text is, again, from atheist readers, non-Christian readers, not incredibly spiritually gifted readers, is to say that Jesus is somehow denying His divinity. He's not denying His divinity. What's He denying? The ability that anybody can just go around calling themselves good. This young man just called himself good, then he wants to call Jesus good. Jesus is like, time out. You're not going to use the same word for you as for me. Jesus is not denying his divinity in this passage. No matter how many atheist bros on YouTube desperately wish that it were so. Jesus is defending the word good. The word good is a moral word. One of the reasons why I love my Presbyterian brothers, and there are many reasons, but one of the reasons why I love my Presbyterian brothers is they taught me what the Puritans knew and what Christians have said for thousands and thousands of years. Which is when I greet you, I say, how are you doing? You say, no, you do not say I'm good. Rose, that's what we do. That's what we do. I am well. My, do you say that? In, do you all say that in Malaysia? I am well. Do y'all? That's a Presbyterian thing. I'm thankful for... Jeffrey, do you ever speak that you use that language? I have, I've taken it up. I've taken it up. Because they understand that the word good is a moral word. Good is a moral word. I'm not good. I'm well. I'm blessed. I'm happy. I'm content. I'm upright, as the old folks would say. I ain't dead yet. I got food in my belly and air in my lungs. But I'm not good. We're still talking ethics, aren't we? Verse 19, Jesus declares what as the ethical code? The Bible. Clearly. What does a Christian worldview contain? This. You are not living out a Christian worldview if you don't know this book. Man, somebody should have amened that. Amen. <laughs> if you don't know this book, you're not living out a Christian worldview. You're not. And even when you think you are, you're not. Because who said what? Go to the book. Go to the book. Go to the book. What do you think when four elders get in a room and we start to disagree with each other? What do you think we do? Just go on seniority? That would mean Brother Yudong wins every single time. We can't do it that way, can we? We go to the book. We go to the book. We go to the book. What are you and I supposed to do when we disagree and defer? Jesus said, what did the Bible say? How does God define morality? Okay, let's keep moving. Verse 20, the young man declares he has kept the law. After today's sermon, do you think that I think that this young man kept the law? Do you think Jesus thought this young man kept the law? Did the young man think that he kept the law? I believe, I believe him when he says. I believe, I believe that he's being sincere when he says I've kept the law. I don't think he's trying to outfox Jesus or twist Jesus. I don't, I don't think this is a test. I think he means it. To a certain extent, I think. Yeah, people might deceive themselves. No question. Yeah. No question. Self-deceiving, sincere. I like both of those words. Sincerely self-deceiving. Yes. Which is like all humans. Yeah. Do y'all understand that what we're saying, what i got to learn your name, brother. Jack Cook. Jack Cook. Ja um, Jack Yeah. Jack I'm sorry. My head is full right now, and I, I'm, I'm struggling. It's, it's, it's my back. Um, my head is full, and my back is hurting. Self-deceiving. <laughs> that that we, we, all, we all do this all the time. Do you all agree with that? 
The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. Do you agree with that? I do. I know my heart. I know my mind. I lie to myself at the drop of a hat, and I'm one of the honest ones. I've spent so many thousands of hours in Christian counseling, so many thousands of hours in Christian counseling with God's people, where they look straight at me and lie to themselves. And it hurts my heart. And then, very kindly, I have to wrestle and struggle. How do I convey biblical truth to this person sitting in front of me who is lying to themselves? It's not, it's not your thyroid if you eat three pieces of cake. It's not. It's not a thyroid problem. It's the three pieces of cake I saw you eat. And the government's not out to get you if you spend all your money on, you know, cars, houses, collectibles, whatever. Government's, government's not out to... I mean, the government may be out to get you, but I know where your money went is my point. We lie to ourselves all the time. All the time. But Jesus is not going to let us do it. Okay, so we're running out of time. Look at verse 21 and tell me what goes in those blanks. Somebody say it. Put the words in. Say it really loudly. Jesus looked at him and loved him. I think this might be the most important verse. I think it might be the most important verse. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it this morning, but I think it might be the most important verse. Precious souls that are sitting in this class right now, hear me very carefully. The God of the universe who took on flesh, and we know as Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He sees you. He sees every part of you. And He loves you anyway. And if that doesn't move you, well then I'm going to pray for that for you as well. Because i got to tell you, the reality that my Lord and my King knows me through and through, does not lie to me, knows every foul corner and part of me, and loves me anyway, is the most glorious thought that captures my heart. That's it. He knows me, He sees me, and He loves me anyway. That's it. Verse 22, uh, verse 21, Jesus gives him an impossible task and a possible task. I always get frustrated. This is one of my favorite texts of Scripture, and I always get frustrated because it gets taught very poorly sometimes. For instance, some people will say, that it's hard for rich people to go to heaven. And you've heard that. We've all heard that. That it's hard. Now, I actually, you've probably heard me say that. It's true that it's hard for rich people to go to heaven. That is a biblical maxim. It's a truth. Why? Why is it a truth? It's just not the truth of this text. But why is it hard for rich people to go to heaven? They're human. Because they're, they're human and they want what they want. We're still having the same conversation, aren't we? Yeah. But let's go a little further with that, Jeffrey. Why is it harder for them? They have a lot to lose. Have a lot to lose. Why don't we say a lot to give up? Yeah, I like both. Y'all get that, right? Because if you want what you want, you got a lot of stuff, you got a lot of wants. You got a lot of desires and wants. That's why anytime I see somebody that's strong-willed, I just, I just kind of chuckle and go... You're going to have it harder. You know how I know that? I'm incredibly strong-willed. Why do you think I like people who aren't strong-willed as much? They're a delight to be around. Not because I run over them. 
Not that. It's because I, like, I, I, I want some of what they got. People who aren't strong-willed are a delight to be around. So Jimmy, I was amening quietly. Aren't they? Charismatic. They're, they're, just peace, they're just peace-loving and easy to get along with. Proverbs, where the heart, where the physical where beauty is deceptive, but your spirit, because you, it's easy to look at somebody that has everything, but we don't look at that they're unhappy on the inside. So you can have everything in the world, but still be unhappy. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's wrap it up. Verse 22, the man met the limits of... So Jesus gave him an impossible task. And a, what was the impossible... What was the... What did Jesus tell him to do? Sell everything and then come follow me. Do you have to sell everything you own to be a Christian? No. Why did Jesus... This is, let's just spend 30 seconds on this. Why did Jesus tell him this? He didn't, tell, he didn't tell Peter and John to sell their fishing business. I'm assuming some gracious little nephew or cousin got it. Why did, why did he tell this man to sell everything he owned and come follow him? Quickly, Josh. We need ten more minutes, Brother Lee. Maybe it was to help him reflect on something. <clears throat> I don't know, reflect on something. Was it almost like a media test of a 72-hour fast just to see what he would do? By the way, I just made that connection. Ain't the Holy Spirit awesome? It's almost like Jesus gave this guy a 72-hour media fast just to see what he would do. Did he pass? Is your heart broken? I think this might... My heart is broken over this. Because Jesus is pressing him playfully. He is judging him playfully. Young man... You've not kept the law. Young man, you are not good. Young man, if you think you're good, and if you think you can keep all the law, let's see how far you can keep the law. You can't. You can't. You can't. So there's a lot here. There's so much here. We're not doing all of it today. Verse 22, the man met the limits of his... What do you think goes there? This word's not in the verse. You've got to come up with it. Flesh. Flesh. Let's, let's get a little closer. Desires. That's a good one. Let's get a little closer. He met the limits of his own conscience. conscience. I like that. That's my favorite. I'm going to say he, he met the limits of his own morality. He let the limits of his own goodness. How good is he? Not good enough to sell everything. Are you all with me? I don't care how good you are, and I've met some good human beings. Raise your hand. You ever met any good human be- moral? Yeah? I met, some, I met some grand ones. I've met some beautiful humans. None of them were perfect and without sin. And all of them had a darkness to them. Thank you for that. All of them had a darkness to them, including the guy that... Didn't even want to do a media fast for his Bible class once a year. And that's just the one I'm telling you about right now. Verse 23 and 25, the impossibility of entrance and reward. Verse 26 and 27, let's just wrap it up. Who can be saved? Everyone and no one? Who can be saved? Come on, somebody do it. This is the Sunday School Answers, your moment. Everyone with God, those who believe. You've got to come to the end of yourself. yourself. Nobody comes to God holding on to part of themselves. Die, die, die to self. Nobody comes to God and says, Hey God, I'm going to hold... Now look, what do we do after we're Christians though? What do we do? Huh? Don't we? What do we do to get saved? And then we start. Yeah? Boy, this is more fun seating. I can't do all this when I'm standing. Alright, last two questions. Last two questions. Final two questions. Number one, what do you think that one is? 
fill in those blanks. Question number one. What do you want? You can talk to me all day long with fancy ethical and moral words. You can be as religious as you want, but I know who you are just by seeing what you do. Well, that's not fun. You also know who I am just by seeing what I do. That's less fun. Can I say that again? From my limited vantage point, if I have a sense of you just from watching what you do, how much more do you think God sees us? How much? Just, just from what we do. Yeah, right. So this is not a great moment, right, Sister Lai? I mean, this is not a fun moment. It's, it's, a, it's a moment of promise. What did Isaiah say when he saw the Lord? I'm undone. What did Job say when he saw the Lord? I'm an unclean man. I place my hands over my mouth. <laughs> One of the reasons why we love Jacob is Jacob's such a goofus. Jacob is not gallant. Jacob thought wrestling with God was a better idea. Limp the rest of his days. I'm more like Jacob than, than Job. What do you want? You should start ask, You should start being honest with yourself every day when you say, "I'm going to watch a movie. I'm going to listen to. I'm going to listen to this on my phone. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that." You don't. I guarantee you. I, I, I would bet big money if I was a betting man. I'm not. I would bet big money that most of you never put the connections between what you do and what you say you want. Because trust me, the things you're doing are mostly the things that you want to do. As soon as you're able and however you can. Second question. Who is Jesus to you? How do we overcome the human condition of desire? We've already said it. Y'all have done really great today. How do we overcome the human condition of desire? With honesty. How do you have honesty? We've already said the heart is deceitful above all things. And I've already said that every person I know lies to themselves more than to anybody else. So how do we do it with, with honesty? I'm pushing you. Just the brown, just brown how we die in Christ. Yeah. Well, we can't do it in our own strength. Yeah, that's, the answer is we can't. Right? You just... Right? Let, let the Lord... Let the Lord have His way. What do you want and who is Jesus to you? What do you want and who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus greater than your wants is another way of saying it. Is Christ greater than your desires? For most of us, most of the time, often, sometimes? So that answer is no. Preachers used to say, show me your wallet and show me your calendar and I can tell you who you are. You ever heard that? Raise your hand if you've heard that. Show me your wallet and show me your calendar and I can tell you who you are. Do you know that AI has figured us out better than most counselors, better than most psychologists? That's what's so scary about data. Listen to me. Data is prescriptive. Data tells you what you're going to do. Data doesn't tell you what you did. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Big, big companies have figured this out. Big tech giants have figured this out. They don't want your data to know what you did. They want your data to know what you are going to do. Do I have your attention? It's scary how frail and fragile and human we are. So you're going to live your life mostly doing the things you want to do. But the, the challenge, the question is, 
Why do you call me good? Ethics is about ethics is about who you bend the knee to. That's it. Ethics is about who you bend the knee to. A Christ follower sees a ten dollar bill, the first thing out of their head is, I need to get this ten dollars back to the owner. That's what a Christ follower does. I'm not fussing at you. Do you hear me? A Christ follower looks at their phone, looks at their technology, looks at their time and says, I'm not going to give it all away. I'm just not. It's too precious. It's too precious. A Christ follower looks at things that come in their way as distractions and say, it's not worth it. It's not enough. I'm speaking idealistically. I know that. You understand that? I'm human too. Final thoughts and words. I'm, I'm done. Final thoughts and words. Thank you all for your um, devotion. Final thoughts and words. Anybody? Comments? Questions? Are you being pushed in Christian worldview? Sunday school? Is it pushing you? All right. Sister Shelley, would you close us in a word of prayer?